Om. So, the Srimad Bhagavatam is a really amazing book. It's a book that can change your life, definitely, if you give it a chance. So, I'm going to do a book review on the Srimad Bhagavatam, okay? Um, to begin with, the book is falling apart at the spine. It's probably a good indication that I've gotten a lot of use out of it, <laughs> that I've learned a lot out of it. Uh, since you can't see the cover, this was the this is the version by Kamala Subramaniam. I will write I will spell it out in this video so that you can look that up and get this if you want. The full Srimad Bhagavatam is like an 18 volume set. So that's a pretty daunting task, but if you're really into it, you should definitely get that. But if you want to just know the stories and learn about it and get you know the the, the meat of it, um, then Get this version of the Kamala of the Srimad Bhagavatam by Kamala Subramaniam. Um, this is uh, the abridged version, so this does not have any Sanskrit in it. So this is just the plain English, you know. Um, let's see, Hastina, the fame city. So just all these stories in this book. They're all amazing stories. But you see, there's no Sanskrit in here, so this is easy to read. Uh, for an English person and for Indians who don't know Sanskrit, which you know most don't these days, um, so I just really recommend this version. It's an abridged version because sometimes Sanskrit texts are too wordy uh, for you know a normal person to be able to appreciate, or even for a very very smart person to be able to appreciate. The other thing I really like about this version is that it has no commentary. Commentaries are fine and all, but I have never ever been able to find any other versions without commentaries. And sometimes the commentaries are just go on and on, and I don't even remember what the original quote was, you know? Some commentaries on these yoga sutras and yoga texts are really, really long, so, which is cool when you want to go in depth, but if you just want to get the story and then think, for, think about it on your own and, you know, make your own mental commentaries and all, that's good too. And... So that's another reason that I like this is because it doesn't have any commentary. It's just the text. You know, you, you make up your own mind about what it means. So I like that. And then, of course, if you're confused, you can go and find all the commentaries because there are so many of them already. So. so this book, I give it five out of five stars, the highest I can give a rating of any book. And you know, if you watch the other ones, I'm voraciously critical. That's what one person who... Uh, had me edit their book and proofread uh, specifically told me that I am voraciously critical. But I found 11 typos in the first eight pages of the book, so I think I did a good job. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, there's no way I can give a higher review for this book. This book is like one of the best things I could ever focus my mind on. Um, why is it so great? Well, a little bit of background on this book. It's written, supposedly it's written by Sage Vyasa. Uh, a you know a, a Brahma Rishi, basically like a a wise sage born said to be born right from the mind of the Creator, Brahma. But just don't worry about all that. That's myth. We don't know. You don't have to know that. I know I'm talking to a lot of people from various backgrounds. Um, it, just know that the, you know this book is written by a sage, a Rishi. And there's an interesting story behind this sage, so that's why I wanted you to know who it was supposedly written by, Sage Vyasa. So in the beginning of the book, the, it starts with, say, you know, it tells that Sage Vyasa is like, you know, he was staring at the banks of a river and a lake and pondering and meditating, and he still felt kind of empty. You know, he was like, you know, I've expounded on Dharma, I've done so much with my life, I've wrote the Mahabharata, I think he might even be credited with writing or compiling the four Vedas or something, but uh, my mind's not, I'm not fully sure on that, but this guy wrote like most of the Dharma literature of the time. You know, he wrote the Mahabharata, the, the story that has the Bhagavad Gita in it with Krishna and Arjuna, all of that. He wrote all these texts and he just expounded on all this, like the right way to live, you know, everything. But he's still feeling like he's like, something's missing, like he's not entirely whole. And he's kind of like, why is that, you know? Um, so as he's contemplating, this other Rishi, or this divine sage, kind of just walks upon him, and his name is Narada. 
and he's awesome. He's just like, he actually knows, he knows everything in a way, but uh, he also plays the role, plays, plays his role in life. So he goes up to Vyasa, he's like, hey, what's wrong, man? Even though he, he really knows what's going on. Um, and Vyasa's like, ah, oh, I'm just not really, ah, something's still missing. You know, I've done all this stuff. I've told people the right way to live. I've explained the right um, rituals, the right sacrifices, the right penances, all these things that you can do to, uh, to you know, change your lot in life, all this stuff. I don't remember the details. It was at the beginning of the book. It's a 700 page book. But basically, uh, Nar Nar uh, Narada is like, here's the thing. Here's your problem. You haven't yet written a text that makes people long for God. You have not yet written a book or a text that makes people just love God and want to love God and just want to long for the union with the beloved God. And we also was like, huh, you're right. And so then he set about writing this book, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is basically the story of all the great incarnations of God, of God, you know, the Lord. Um, the Lord is described as Vishnu or Narayana, and it is, this is the account of all the many times, it's basically the account of all the creation stories, like all the myths, pretty much all the myths of India, all the main ones are in this book. And so it's got all the creation stories, so it's kind of like a Bible for India, it's kind of like the Bible of India in a sense. Um, uh, it has like its, you know, version of Genesis and things like that. But then it also just has all these, you know, kind of biographies or accounts of the divine, of God incarnating and becoming man just for the sake of love and for the sake of, sal you know, uh, out of compassion for the suffering and the people who are lost here. And, um, uh, there's just something that happens when you read all these stories and, and you read over the stuff. It just slowly starts to transform your mind and you start to really not see things as being so separate or so different. And you start to slowly see a lot of uh, the oneness in all of reality or non-dualism as they say in, in Hinduism. So it's a really, it's a really, really good book. Um, it will also, it will make you love God and long for God if that's something that you want you know it's not gonna if you don't want that to happen no one can make that happen no book can make that happen but if you do this is a great one so I, I would suggest this book for people who have an inclination towards bhakti yoga or dhyana yoga because also with respect to dhyana yoga uh, self-inquiry and knowledge uh, this book really clearly explains how everything is God and everything is one thing kind of like astrology you know if you we all hear that we all hear yeah everything is one everything is God sure but intellectually just hearing that doesn't make me a better person it doesn't make me more enlightened I have to see it every day from looking at charts and see wow again this and this is happening again you have to see God showing his work you know what I mean in the little details or that's how it works that's how jhana yoga is supportive for someone with respect to astrology, with this it's the same way. With books, you you just you're seeing and and identifying with these characters and seeing the crazy stuff they go through, but then how it all somehow works out miraculously in this divine way. And you just yeah, you just start to kind of a uh, it starts to really become a more real thing to you. So this book is said to get people enlightened, um, and I really think that there's a lot of truth to that. Um, but then again, also, if you just want to know more about the myths as an astrologer, read this book because all the myths, like the myths of Rahu and Ketu, or how different things come to be, there's a lot of astrological symbolism in this book, a lot of talk of nakshatras and different planets, and all the avatars of each planet are in here, you know? So if you want to learn more about Mars, learn about the incarnation of Mars, Nar Narasimha, you know? and read that or I don't think I, I don't know if I'm saying that right I don't know how you pronounce that um, if you want to learn more about um, the Sun learn more about Ram and read about that incarnation here learn about Krishna if you like the moon um, etc in fact this book is considered to be so good at uh, enlightening us that that's also kind of the point of this book is that the very beginning it starts with a king who has been poisoned and is going to die in a week 
and all the grand sages and all these people around him. He's like the last great king of the higher age. Um, and then we're about to like go into lower ages and, or wait, no, I think I might be mixing that up with someone else. Forgive me. It's a really long book, a lot of stories, but this king, he's like one of the last great kings, or he's just a great king. Let's say that. I know that. And he's been bit by uh, a serpent. Uh, he has a, he's been poisoned. He's about to die in seven days. And they're like, he certainly wants to be as liberated as he can be. And so all, you know, different sages and different wise men are saying like, okay, do this, do that, meditate, do this penance, this mantra, this or that. And then uh, Sukha, who I believe is the son of Vyasa, just tells him, look, you know, my father wrote this book that gets, gets you enlightened uh, no matter what without fail by focusing on it. And that's, you know, just I just want to tell you the story. Just let me tell you the story of the Srimad Bhagavan. At Bhagavatam, and you'll get enlightened because just hearing these stories and focusing and contemplating on the Lord at this end of your incarnation, you're just going to go towards that when you die because that's all your mind is going to be focused on. Um, in other words, Sukha says, he's like, I think he says, one who only thinks of God is enlightened and liberated. And he's like, if you want to only think of God, this is the key for you because this book will will just you'll get so enraptured in these stories and so ident identify with it that you'll be dreaming about it, thinking about it. It'll be more entertaining to you than movies or Netflix or any of this other stuff. So your mind's just only on God. So just in amount of time, you'll be enlightened. So that's kind of how this book works. So I highly recommend it, and it is mainly like a a bhakti yoga book, a book that a lot of uh, Vishnu followers wear, uh, read, but it's got much more than that. It's got a lot to it. And really, you know, at the end, it goes into saying how bhakti and dhyana together are like an unstoppable combination. And I personally really identify with that as well because I have a, a inclination towards uh, the yoga of knowledge as well, and not just devotion. And of course, um, a lot of people do. All right. So get that book if you want. It's a good read. Take care.